Good. There we go. Uh, Sorry, guys, for the delay there. Um, yeah, so as you said, um, we're from KPMG. Um, Pranita and I are both from the data team. We'll give some intros in a second. Uh, we're from Lighthouse, which is KPMG's data practice. Um, so we basically specialize in a lot of different data operations. Uh, primarily, uh, Pranita and I focus on data engineering. Um, Power BI is one of the tools, one of the key tools in our arsenals. Um, we deliver dashboards and a kind of end to end solution to our clients uh, from a range of different industries um, and fields. So um, we'll just jump into some intros quickly. Um, my name is Marcus. I started my career in sports analytics um, using Power BI to assist uh, some British Olympic teams um, in what the, what they were doing in some of their sports performance analysis. Um, I actually had the opportunity to help uh, British swimming um, in Tokyo, which was a really good opportunity for me. Learned a lot, um, a lot about development and some of the stuff that can go wrong with develop development. Uh, at the moment, I'm responsible for developing and implementing some of the ETL pipelines that we use at KPMG. Um, so I'm one of the BI data engineers on the team. Uh, I also do a little bit of software development to automate some of our data processes. Uh, you can see me actually here presenting exactly the same intro slide um, at a previous Robert Walters event. Um, I promise I do actually have other hobbies, uh, mostly limited to the gym, um, but I have been doing a couple of these recently. Um, and with that, I'll hand over to my colleague, Pranita. Hello, everyone. My name is Pranita Patel, and I'm from Data Architecture and Engineering team. And some of my amazing colleagues are here just to support me. Yeah. Um, at the heart, I'm an engineer. I'm back from um, India. I've done my bachelor's there and I came to UK for business analytics because yeah, I want best of both worlds. Uh, my day to day work job is I do Power BI development and some data modeling and other things that go around with it. If at all I was not here, you would find me cooking in some part of the world and traveling and seeing the entire world. So that's yeah, I love delicious food and traveling is what I live for. Uh, good, so that's us. Um, it's time for a little activity for us to get to know you and um, break the ice a little bit as well. Um, so we're going to ask some questions and with each question, we're going to get you to put your hands down if they apply to you. Do five-ish questions uh, going from a kind of more engineering perspective to a more design-oriented perspective. Okay, so with that, with that, everybody, if you could put at least one hand up. Right, that's everybody in the room, please. Yeah, thank you. Let's all contribute. Cool. Um, so first question, uh, put your hand down. If you are strictly engineering, don't get involved with any design work. Um, you do a lot of back end stuff, whether that's in Power BI or SQL or any other service that could be related to Power BI or data. A couple of hands, but most people are involved in design in to some extent. Right, so put your hands down if you're mainly an engineer, but you do get involved with some of the design decisions or you implement some design that other people based on decisions that other people make. Again, actually not that many hands went down. Uh, mostly, mostly people that are involved with design here. So again, hands down 50-50. 50-50-ish, close to 50-50. Yeah, okay, more hands this time. Okay, so I think we know the audience now. But hands down if you're mostly design uh, with a little bit of engineering there too, or at least you can do some engineering speak. Cool, losing a lot more hands there. <laughs> and anybody who's strictly design. No, actually lost all the hands this time. So nobody's here just for free pizza and bev. That's that's fair. Um, I actually am. <laughs> um, cool. So do a little bit of a roadmap for tonight. Um, we'll start with why you should care about design, um, why good design and good design best practice is important. Probably one more oriented to the more engineering oriented people in the room. Um, I know as an engineer, engineer myself, when I first started at KPMG, it's very tempting to just focus on the engineering, focus on the code and almost treat design as an after afterthought. So we'll talk a little bit, a bit about why that's not right, the right perspective to take. We'll also talk, having established the importance of good design, how to actually make good design happen, right? So we'll start with the basics and we'll build onto some stuff that maybe you won't have heard before, or at least you might have not considered in a formal context. And then we'll talk about how to integrate this into part of your development process, right? So. This is kind of more geared towards the end to end folks, but also towards folks who work in an end to end team. OK, so we'll start with kind of why design is important, right? So at KPMG, we try to deliver three things with a good dashboard. First and foremost, obviously, you have to have accurate, high quality data on the dashboard, and it has to be visible in some intuitive way, right? You want users to look at your dashboard and know, understand what it means and be able to trust the data that's being presented to them. Second, we want to use visuals to tell a story about the business or the business process. So 
users should be able to use your dashboard and the story that it tells to understand something about the real world, right? Because otherwise, why are they using it, right? So they should be able to explore, they should be able to engage, and they should be able to learn something in plain English about the real world. And finally, a good dashboard should empower the user to explore and interact with their data, right? Because otherwise they would just look at a table, right? Why look at a dashboard if you're not looking to interact and explore the data? And really it's on that final point that design becomes a really important principle. So design and interaction realistically are inseparable. And we'll talk a little bit about why that is the case later. But to start off, um, it's really tempting for engineers to spend a lot of time building the back end and think, you know, this is a solid piece of work. My SQL server is airtight. My data model is locked in. My logic is solid. And then to kind of treat the design as secondary, just kind of dump all the visuals on a page. It's easy. We did it. All the data is right. So just use it and just filter it as you need to. Now, that's fine if your audience is an engineer, because they'll probably also want to do that. And in fact, they won't look at the dashboard. They'll just want to jump into the data and look at that. Typically, though, you're not designing a dashboard for an engineer, you're actually designing a dashboard for a non-technical audience, or at least the primary audience is not going to be an engineer. So what you want is a design, a dashboard that's developed with strong design best practices, because you want somebody to look at your dashboard and think that's something that I want to use. First of all, I implicitly trust it because it looks good. And second of all, this is something that I want to use. This is something that has a pleasant experience to engage with. And for that reason, Really, a well-designed dashboard that has a pretty poor back end behind it is going to get more engagement than a very well very well developed dashboard with a poor design. And with that, I'm going to hand over to my colleague Pranita, who's going to talk a little bit about how we can elevate dashboards. Thank you, Marcus. As an engineer, I know when we work on the back end of the things, put in our hard work in creating measures and all the complicated things. I have an unhealthy attachment with all the things that I create. I want everything to be displayed nicely, gloriously, and I want each and everything to get the attention. But it's not always that case. As Marcus mentioned, it's not the engineers that are at the end of our dashboards, but it should be more accessible to each and every person who takes a look at it. Most of the times, many of you must have heard the term that consider user as a toddler that once he should be able, he or she should be able to get through it without any help. So if at all, you guys would take a few minutes and tell me how can this dashboard may be enhanced? What are the few things that you would point out? Let's just hear some call outs from the audience. Anything? Have a look at it. Consider it. Busy. Busy. Yeah. Very busy. Too much. Right. Nothing stands out. It's a good point. No, yeah, I don't know what's good. <laughs> I agree. Those uh, gauges are good or bad. Right. Yeah. Numbers. Too many decimals. Too many decimals. There's no logic to the layout. Right. Yeah, it, yeah. it seems like it's all okay, gauges, <laughs> right? Everything's a key performance indicator. <laughs> Everything looks important. So. But I think it's really good and well done for delivering it to your latest client. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is our last talk, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> So amazing points. Yes, there are a few things that we always keep in mind, like keep our visualizations to minimum. Right now, everything is attracting your attention and you're not focusing at any of the point. And this is what you may call as something of a bad example of a visualization. Something I am sure that everything that is shown here might lead to a, a decision making at the end, but there are different ways to uh, represent it. So the usability of the dashboard is improved. Coming up to this, now COVID was an amazing time to see a lot of wonderful dashboards, something that brought out an emotion, a big scare, how many people are dead, how many, uh, <laughs> yeah, that's the first thing. I used to look for how many people are dead. Oh my God. <laughs> All the statistics that came up and not every person pays an enough attention to see like how they are represented. So if you guys have a look at it and again, if you could point out a few things, what are wrong and what is like misleading for you guys over there? No. And it's the US and who cares? Fuck <laughs> them. <Awesome. laughs> I let it out. Scale is wrong. 
Yes. So the things like this, wrong visualizations might actually provoke wrong responses. And as we know, with a single, a human being takes a very small amount of time to process any kind of visualization. So it might actually give misleading results to the end, uh, end user than what you actually intended it to be. So coming towards the basic stepping stones of our dashboard designs, all of us literally swear by these uh, starting with understanding your audience understanding what is the purpose of our dashboard how it is going to be used what is the main decision making that's going to be carried out from it going ahead with give the context not every user would know why you are representing a particular thing so use correct labels use tool tips there are a lot of many functionalities in power bi itself that can give you immense advantage of getting your point across with the minimalistic design that can be another few things are use the right visualizations we all know how popular our pie charts are in our community <laughs> Uh, going ahead with, yes, use themes, be consistent, and a lot of other things, which I'm pretty sure you all know of. Going ahead, uh, so apart from the basic things, I hope this is something few of you might be able to take out of this session. So first coming up to Jacob's Law, which says that your design should, should be intuitive. Now, all our designs should be intuitive, yes, of course. But the process of your entire dashboard should be as natural as possible. Make it as simple as possible so user can get most out of it. Aesthetic usability effect. You can say the, thing, the dashboards that are more aesthetic, it creates a positive response in your user. There has been statistics which actually show that if your dashboard looks pretty, the user is actually going to not pinpoint the things that are wrong with it. I'm not saying that you should do that. <laughs> it is definitely going to be a positive point for you. So going ahead with that, we have storytelling. We have heard of this a million times that our visualizations should tell a story, a start point where all of the pieces come together and end to a point where it is the actual deliverable to your audiences. Coming up to accessibility. Now, this is hot topic. And this was one of the first things that me and Kathy, my colleague who is here, we worked on when we first joined KPMG. Your dashboard should be usable to as wider audience as possible with making minimalistic changes to it. There are tons of uh, accessibility features that are available in a lot of visualization softwares. I work on Power BI. So talking from that point of view, there are many things that are like using proper color combinations, having navigation tools, using alt text so that it reads out to the visually disabled uh, audience of yours. So just make it as accessible as possible so you have a wider audience group. Coming back to usability testing, where it is very easy for user to take something totally different from what you intended for them to give. So make sure you go through usability testing. It provides and delivers actual point that you intend to so that you achieve the most optimal design there can be. Now, Marcus will take you through our development cycle and show you some very interesting demos. Um, yeah, so as Pranita's explained, we now kind of know how to make design happen. Um, I think hopefully everybody's taken something from the last two slides that they can take home and you know start implementing into a dashboard. Um, I think it's important also to talk about where design fits into the kind of general development process. Now, um, my bosses are going to be a little bit angry at me because this is actually kind of our general um, development pipeline. And it typically starts by gathering the requirements and understanding like, what, do actually, what do users actually want. Um, and you can see there that from the very beginning, um, we've got a mock-up of what the users might want. We've got a mock-up. We've got a general sketch of what a user might want from a dashboard. And that goes straight into prototyping, where we actually develop something that users can look at and say, is this actually the intended experience? Is this something that they're going to want and if th that they're going to engage with um, in the way that we expect them to engage with it? And then we've got the de development process where we take those kind of design decisions, we take the requirements gathering, we turn it into a dashboard that they can actually use. And finally, we end up with release, right? Now, I think the important point that I want to draw attention to in this slide is that engineering decisions are actually made very far downstream. So you're not making any engineering decisions until you basically know exactly what the client wants. 
And so everything up to that point is basically a design conversation, right? So um, it's very important that your design influences what you build. And that's why it's so important to kind of take heed of some of the things that we were saying earlier, because um, it's no good having a very well built back end. And then suddenly you have to design this dashboard and make that kind of magically meet up to what the client wants. But your back end doesn't support the type of dashboard that the client wants delivered, right? Uh, then you have to go and rechange your back end and suddenly you're duplicating labor when really you could have just followed a logical process, started with what the client's looking for, designed it well, and then made the back end fit what they actually want to use. Um, good, so we'll move into a little bit of a demo now. Uh, get out of this and into this. Who's seen Barbie? Couple of hands, yeah. So hopefully this is something that we can engage with, right? So um, little story here, okay? We, des we designed this dashboard for Barbie Inc. Um, Barbie Inc wanted to know um, how many Barbies They've got some jobs in the pipeline um, in various sectors and in various industries. Barbie Inc. caters to the world's biggest problems, such as healthcare, finance, and research. But if we actually drill down into that a little bit, we can actually see that some jobs that they have in the pipeline are like curing cancer, saving the world, building general intelligence, and some really complex neurosurgery problems. If we drill into that a little bit deeper, we can go into career detail and we can see that uh, we've got the talent available in Barbie's uh, in Barbie's body of staff. We've got everything that we need. Um, we've got the skills that we require, including influence and communication to save the world, right? Um, and then, of course, if you've seen the Barbie movie, you'll know that most Barbies have a Ken. So we need to know that there are enough Kens available to keep the party alive while the Barbies go and save the world. Uh, and you can see, fortunately, we've got plenty of Kens with the skills of beach and party. Um, so this is cool, right? This is a good dashboard, but we haven't actually done anything in Power BI yet. This is all in Figma. This is our design tool, not our design tool. It's a design tool on the market, and it's basically what we use to design our dashboards. So we're not going to design one uh, live because this was built by one of our design experts, and I probably couldn't recreate this. Um, but what it allows us to do is basically understand the user story and prototype a user story before we actually deliver a dashboard. So we know how users are gonna engage with it. We know the impact that they're gonna have. Now, some of you will have seen some crazy numbers like, uh, I don't know, 1.2 million in weighted, uh, weighted pipeline value. This is a clash that we sometimes have with uh, our clients. And it's important just to remind them that this is basically a glorified PowerPoint slide. Um, and if you don't have the Figma capabilities, you would basically be doing this in PowerPoint. It's just an elevated step on top of PowerPoint really. Um, so it's important to note that there's no data being displayed here. However, if you then go a step further and actually design, decide to implement this, you can take quite a big chunk of your design work directly into PowerPoint and actually end up with a well-designed, uh, sorry, Power BI, and actually end up with a well-designed Power BI dashboard um, that actually caters to the user's needs. And we can see that just like in our previous design, because we designed the story and we made the dashboard fit the prints, we used design principles to make a dashboard that's intuitive, that makes us want to explore, just reading like right to left. If we cl click on reinvent the wheel as one of the Barbie jobs down in the pipeline, and if we select Barbie on the drill through, we get taken to a page that shows us what Barbies we have on skill, on staff, that are capable of reinventing the wheel. Um, and so you can see that, again, we're just kind of cultivating that user story. We're just creating the experience that users want to engage with. If we then go back and verify that, in fact, we have enough Kens with the right skill set to reinvent, to keep the party alive while the Barbies reinvent the wheel, we can see that we've got plenty of Kens with video games as skill. So I think they're fairly capable of keeping the party alive and staying fun, keeping some fun in the vibes while the Barbies are out reinventing the wheel. OK, so uh, that's kind of uh, that's kind of our talk on design. Uh, we'll leave you with some. A little bit of a summary and some key points that you can take home.
this to wrap up the session designs is much more than just pretty colors and it can actually step up your entire dashboard to a much higher level i would say to do a proper justice to your back end etl and everything that you've worked on design will play a much important part and it would just do your justice for all the work that you've done we hope that you have got to learn something or find out something new and interesting that you guys might want to implement thank you Happy to pick up any questions or comments, concerns. Yeah, I'll start with somebody from the audience, Maria. Sorry, I saw a hand go up over there. No, go on, Maria. Oh, sorry. What was the, the time you took to create the Figma? Something versus actually creating a prototype. So this is a uh, we did this today. Um, <laughs> so um, yeah, it was actually nice because Figma doesn't have a lot of load times, um, and it's very intuitive for designing. So we didn't have to spend, because I don't know if anybody's done a lot of design work in Power BI, but like just waiting for colors to change on things, waiting for drop downs to pop up, finding where things are, like finding where the option is to change the color of the bar on this graph, uh, for some reason is just an absolute pain sometimes. Um, so just in terms of mocking up something very quickly, we actually find Figma really speeds up the process because we're not having to go through and uh, wait for load times. It's a tool that's built to design. Um, so that's why we typically use it to design. Um, and the fortunate thing is, uh, so obviously Power BI allows for version control now, but um, our whole process is set up so that engineering and design can work kind of in parallel to, to, an, to a degree. Um, so Pranita and I were building the back end for that. Uh, dashboard while this was being designed. We just kind of had a steady stream of communication about what's being designed, what are the requirements, what are we trying to build for. Um, we kind of constantly saw uh, what's coming out of the design work um, at each stage. Um, so we could very carefully align our back end work to the design that was coming down the pipeline. Yeah. So can you take some of that design from Figma? And use that directly in Power BI. Can you save things as a what? What do you what? What's the basics that you do? Do you save it as a page so that you can yeah as a template? As a template. So you can see template. here, we actually have um, these are not the latest ones. I think that we used. Oh, there we go. Um, so you actually just delete everything from it. Um, keep the background. Keep the bits that you want. Sometimes you might keep text on here, um, just so that you don't have to fiddle with Power BI text. So um, we didn't do it for this. But typically, we might, uh, rather than actually using the measures text, the subtitle, yeah. we might just have that invisible and actually have it visible on Figma. Um, again, it just allows for tighter control. It like uh, allows for consistency between what we promise and what we deliver. Um, so yeah, you just save it as a PNG, upload it as a background uh, in Power BI. So if you go to the background, canvas background here, you see, you can see there. You can select an image. Um, like any different in the aesthetics and the way that it works is like for like. Yeah. And you just really like that. And I think it's sorry. Uh, just to dovetail off that quickly. Um, I think like Maria says, Maria uh, users really like to engage with that because it also forces us, it keeps our feet to the fire in terms of our engineering decisions. It can be tempting when you promise something and there's no like binding thing that the user has seen to go like, they won't notice the difference, right? Um, it actually forces us to elevate the quality of what we're doing because the users have seen something, they've interacted with something, they then expect to kind of be able to interact with it the same way when you deliver. Um, so it kind of holds our feet to the fire in terms of the engineering decisions that we make down the line. I would just echo what you say. Really. Yeah. Doodle and add colleague upon Figma, then we can do it in natural consideration. So, Monday, Doodle, by Friday, got functional element then. Yeah, yeah. The data that's on display is that just written the data on your Figma? Uh, yeah, it's text, text boxes. Um, yeah, so. You can do quite a lot with Figma. Uh, I personally haven't really tapped the potential of Figma. I know there are ways to like, you know, put kind of pre-built custom elements and things in there. I don't know how to do that. Um, but yeah, it's definitely something for you to look into. Um, but yeah, you won't, you'll never be able to connect live data to it, to my knowledge. 
um, it's just going to be basically a glorified image. So again, so we, we try to basically have there be like virtually no difference, right? So, um, but to do that, there's, we, we do a lot, right? So we'll, we'll, as much that we can get from Figma, I don't know to what extent I can go into specifics, but we take as much from Figma and put it into Power BI as we can, whether that's axes, text, titles, everything that we can take from Figma that we don't have to like make in Power BI reduces load time a little bit, a tiny bit, but it actually just allows for that consistency of visualization. Yeah. Is there any accessibility tool or guideline that you would use at the end of the project? I think Pranita is a good one to pick that one up. Uh, yeah, so I would uh, speak regarding Power BI. There are uh, several inbuilt features that you can use. <clears throat> and on top of that, there are a few things that you can implement. I think uh, the inbuilt ones are about the navigation and everything. And the other ones that you can impl implement are tab orders, which actually takes uh, when the <clears throat> When the computer is navigating a visually impaired person throughout it, it takes it from the way that you have arranged. So a normal person reads from left to right. So if you arrange the tab orders in like that, it will take. You can also add things like alt text that reads out the visual to them, like what is happening in there and several other features. I think Power BI in their latest release, they said they're going to come up with uh, many new accessibility features that can help. And there are a few of them that are you uh, already implemented and you don't need to configure them at all. Sorry, uh, you were first, I think. Um, would you say that the person who does the design work with the business or the audience needs to have um, a really good understanding of Power BI to know what the mm. features actually are? Good question. Um, so I think. So at a minimum, they need to know what's possible, right? They need to know what's possible from a visualization perspective um, and what's going to require downloading and creating custom visuals. Um, we've had this in the past where um, there's a bit of a disconnect um, and you find that your engineering team is sitting there six weeks down the line going like, how, right? Like, how do we stack visuals on top of each other to make this happen? Um, so yeah, I think it's I think it's good for them to have built a dashboard in Power BI to have presented something to a client before, but there's no need why they need to know how to do a data warehouse, right? Um, I mean, those conversations should be going on. They should be in communication with the engineering team or whoever's actually building the back, whoever's building the dashboard. Um, but at a minimum, to be able to present something to a client, to be able to design something, um, I'd say the bar is pretty low. Yeah. Got any tips for weaning people on spreadsheets? <laughs> Uh, yeah, I'll say no, and I'm going to get your number so that if you do find out how to do it, please let me know because <laughs> it's kind of a constant headache that we have. Um, yeah, I mean, we were having this conversation again the other day where it's uh, we're kind of trying to meet requirements and we're having this conversation saying it's going to take some time to actually build this in a way that you want. Um, if you want an Excel spreadsheet with some visualizations on it, just do that, right? Like just sit down and do that quickly. Um, don't ask for a dashboard if an Excel spreadsheet is what you want. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think I'll actually pass the floor to my managers and see if they've got anything to note on that. My point on it is like business software. You touched on it earlier, pretty tonight, that you don't you shouldn't need a manual to use it. Um, but a lot of BI is also very discretionary in its use. So we're all forced to use our ERP systems and our core business software, APMG are on SAP, and it's horrendous at timesheets and all that sort of thing. Um, but you sort of have a choice whether or not you use the BI software that people build you. And if it doesn't do what you want it to do, you're going to go back to spreadsheets. So if you're a senior leader, you're going to go back to the guy that's always sharing the data out for you. Um, so it's all so an awful lot of it is in the requirements of the design these the requirements. Otherwise, you just choose like to use it. Um, so I don't know if that answers the question, but it's perhaps more of an observation. I mean, I would say I'd, I'd probably add to that. I mean, probably in that requirements piece, you, you should be asking the businesses what, what are the questions you want to answer. And really challenging, does an Excel 
spreadsheet actually give you that answer because they've got to then do all the data analysis and all that work. So it's kind of trying to play on that, that it's going to give them a bit in terms of actually answering rather than then doing the work for them. Yeah, yeah. Or, or if, they, if they still export it to Excel, put it into other visualisation, probably missed a requirement. Yeah. 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 Uh, add to that where I think to get people off Excel sheets, it's a multi-year process, right? You're never going to fully do it. But if the organisation has a strategy of We'll choose Power BI because that's where we are today. They've got a strategy of Power BI and they've bought those licenses. Mm -hmm. Then engage the senior execs and get those guys wowed by Power BI and the automatic refresh. Get them away from expecting an email at the month end that shows last month's figures and give them a, an Excel, not an Excel, a Power BI report, mm -hmm. which is constantly up to date. But on the top right hand corner says, updated 5 30 p.m yesterday right let them see the figures in real time and suddenly you'll find that all the middle managers will be mandated to start to use power bi because the cto's will go do not give me something in excel i want the power bi spreadsheet uh, power bi report and then suddenly you'll have a lot of you'll have a lot of report requirements which comes back to another issue is you built the the data warehouse specifically for this report. And of course, then that's going to morph and you, you then go back and change your requirements for data warehouse. But I think it's that's how you, you get rid of the spreadsheet, how you reduce that spreadsheet um, use. I think our issue isn't that we're not the same with Power BI, you know, the data we're just not visually articulate. Mm -hmm. So if you give them a Power BI report, you just want it that looks like a spreadsheet. Mm -hmm. And that comes back to requirements, isn't it? So what do you use? What's the important yeah. number of this spreadsheet? Why have you got a thousand lines? Yeah. What are you really doing? And if they really read every thousand lines of the spreadsheet, it's probably the best thing. But if they're using it for something else, then try, try, let's try and find out what the something else is, I guess. Sorry, gentleman over here, I think, had a question. Yeah. Um, can you just bring the Figma? screen like okay. sure so i've i've done visualizations in power bi as, a, as you were saying uh, sorry in, in powerpoint as you were saying there but they're like really bog basic graphs or placeholder images that look nothing like the you know, resulting graphic that you actually put in power bi sure but yours look very similar to power bi so to what extent have you built that to make it look like it's power bi so again um the idea here really is that the user is feeling like like if you're walking them through the prototype they should think it's power bi yeah. right because um small differences are going to affect the user experience um small differences are going to affect how your user engages with the with the piece of software so um yeah i mean this is like we've got really good designers on our team right and they've built up um just like a, a an arsenal of elements and visuals that they can recycle um and i i, I would honestly like the best advice i've got there is just you know, spend some time in the trenches, um, make things like copy a copy a dashboard to Figma and trace it um, and just build up that arsenal and build up that experience. Um, because I'm not a designer myself. Um, I've had to do wireframes in the past. They've been shocking, um, but uh, compared to this, um, but that's the best advice I've got is just like try to mirror the, the, the experience that you're trying to create. Um, uh, sorry, laptop's going to die for running out of time. Um, try to mirror the experience that you're trying to create and the rest will speak for itself, I think. So that KPI tree, for instance, you've got mm -hmm. right, the one on the side that's just that been on the top there. Yep. That's not been inherited from how that's purely been recreated from scratch yeah. in Figma. Yeah, it's just a bunch of rectangles and um, it's a single image or an individual thing. As individual, I think. The thing is, there are a lot many things in there. The kind of visualizations we have in Power BI, almost all of the examples are there in Figma. So you can pick it up from there. And that is why you're seeing it so similar to that. Because if you have a funnel chart there, you have a funnel chart example here. When we get our requirements in our mind, this is our basic rules that we put all the KPIs ahead and the most important filters on the right side and this. Just follow the same thing. The things that you're seeing that it is so close to KP, uh, our Power BI because everything is in, built in the option. It's just drag and drop. That's all. It's, it's software that's made for design, right? So 
um, and it's specifically software that's made to design user experience and user interface. So uh, I guess just lean on the software, experiment with it a bit um, and show us what you come out with at the next talk. It's free to get all of. So you don't need to license yourself all big. And we we started out the same way. I think we started out with we we used to have sketches that were just you know, we had an artist at the team doing at one point. We'd sketch out KPI boxes and things like that, put them onto pages. And then we ended up in PowerPoint and then it just looks doesn't look great for them. And then just the journey with being on, we ended up with Figma. Mm -hmm. KPMG's got a digital design, you even sent a design team that were all over this. So we're lucky enough to pull them in the sort of built fit of the tool kit. So we've basically got a toolbox of visualizations that we can just read to help rapidly prototype. Uh, but I think once you got stuck into this, I don't feel like to go back to doing it at one point. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I use this quite a lot actually yeah. for my design. Uh, if a free pizza and beer yeah. then. <laughs> I didn't know you were going to go into Figma actually, but yeah, so it's good. I use it for templates. Yeah. Um, I, just, I just create a dashboard within that and just superimpose the elements of Power BI onto it. Yeah. Is there any difference between that version and the, and the paid version? Is it of Figma. Of Figma. I think we use the free version, don't we? Oh. I'll tell you. <laughs> an enterprise designer or a team with more pages, organize things better, but the free version gets you a lot if you're like single handed team. <laughs> yeah. I find um yeah, it's good for one page, but then you can hide elements on here you don't want to see them and export them separately. Yeah. So cool. Uh, someone mentioned before about when somebody goes through this design process with a, a stakeholder, how much do they need to say about Power BI? What about them understanding the, the data. So um, I came up with a project recently that went through a similar process. Um, we actually balsamic and we load wireframes. I say we did a lot of wireframes. I inherited a load of wireframes right. from somebody else. <laughs> and it was things like, well, actually that metric doesn't have any relationship to that dimensional element. And that's not, you know, the dashboard design weren't actually possible because yeah. nobody had done that sort of data discovery piece to understand that actually you know, how everything's related to each other. So like, I guess what part of, when's the timeline for doing this design piece? Because it kind of feels if you do it too far in advance and you've not got that sort of fundamentals of the subject area, that's going to be a problem. Yeah, good question. I think, um, to be honest, I think my man, uh, they can probably comment on this as well, but I think it's like an evolving approach for us. Um, we have recently had discovery phases that actually include a little bit of data discovery, but typically in the past, we have just kind of based the wireframes on the requirements. And then as the data comes in, we've committed to something and we just deliver it, right? We deliver it to the extent that it's possible to deliver with the data. Um, at times you'll have to rework wireframes and just have that honest conversation and say, listen, um, we had this understanding of how the business process worked and we made some assumptions around how the data would support that. Um, that hasn't turned out to be valid. There we go. Yeah. 